You are listening to Fanfa Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Lowcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. Hello and welcome to episode 128 of Making Tracks, brought to you by those fine folk over at fanfortracks.com. My name's Mark, I am one of your co-hosts, and it's me this week who has to do a really naff introduction for our other co-host, and that is, of course, Mr. Mark Newbold. Mark, how you doing, buddy? That's the best intro you've ever done. I know, it's because I didn't insult you. Do you think that's yeah. what it is? Okay. Yeah, but the insults are normally the best. I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm used to insults. Bring them on. Excellent. So it sounds like you're lubed and ready to go for this episode then. Fully lubed and ready to rock. Wicked. Right, so press play on your pre-recorded answer to this. How's things been? How's your week in Star Wars been, my friend? I've done nothing. I've just sat on my arse all week doing <laughs> nothing. No, no, it's, it's been weird, weirdly, weirdly been very, very busy. Loads going on in Fanta Tracks. Loads happening with the podcasts and writing for various outlets it's been busy mark it's been busy how about you it's been pretty steady for me actually ticking along nicely big question and it is a big question this time have you had any star wars stuff come through this week i have and i will Ooh. tell you i will tell you about two things there's been other bits and bobs that Go have come in that have gone upstairs up into the top collection okay. i had like you did last week the order from zavi the little lunchbox uh-huh, which cool. was very yep. cute. So mine had R2 and 3P on one side, and I think it had Han and Luke been caught by the Ewoks. It's on the B yeah, side. Yeah. So really, really cute. The little thermos rubber inside eraser for our American friends. But I think the big one that came this week for me, my razor crest turned up. Yay! Have you had your I, razor yes, crest yet? I have yes. got my razor crest. Have yes. you opened it though? No. No, me neither. <laughs> Have you not? No. I thought you were doing a. I thought you were going to do like a whole unboxing thing and I, you know stick it on social and all that. I will. So it's it's. I got it out of the packing box, you know, the main box. And there's a few dinks on the corners, which I'm seeing a lot online. People are getting like creased corners of the boxes, but you know, hey ho, it's one of those. I'm not overly worried about that. Yeah, the plan is to open it up, you know, get the video rolling, see what we can do with it. Yeah, I mean, I need the space to open it up, so I'm sort of making room to do it because I don't want to do it in my kitchen. That's a bit crap. Yeah. So I want to yeah. find somewhere nice to to open it up. But that is the plan, and I'm assuming you're thinking of doing something similar? No. Currently, it is residing in the lounge because I have... I haven't got anywhere to put it in the collection room at the moment. I haven't had time to just kind of like move stuff around. Mm. But my plan, at least until I have somewhere definite that I can fit it, it's going to stay in the shipper. Okay. I'm not even going to open it. I'm just going to leave it. And I said to Karen, I was like, do you know what? There's a big risk for me doing this that will make it easier for me to kind of go, you know what? I'm just going to sell it on. I'm pretty sure that I'm not likely to because I have seen all the photos and there's been tons and tons and tons of people who've yeah. posted photos yeah. of a Razor Crest. So I've kind of slightly lived vicariously through them. <laughs> and also I've also kind of lived slightly vicariously through those who've actually said, yeah, I'm not opening mine up and keeping it in the shipper and all that. And, you know, seeing people jump and pounce on them on social media and kind of go you can't do that that's just crazy and blah 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 and each to their own yeah i tell you what some really fun stuff you can do with it i've been seeing a lot of people buying these kind of really small micro led lights and relighting the whole ship so you can create a more authentic scene okay. yeah you can put these little kind of micro leds inside the actual cockpit and the cargo hold but also you can get the engines to light up as well so i thought that's pretty cool if you if you're up for that kind of stuff and modding and what have you i thought that'd be pretty wicked over the stairs, I've got slat wall in, so I'm planning on putting slat wall in there, make good use of that space, but at the bottom, I want a big shelf, quite a deep shelf, and as long as we can measure it right so I'm not whacking my head on the shelf every time I go upstairs <laughs> yeah. or going downstairs, that's where I'm going to put the crest. Hopefully, there'll be room for the figures above it. So that's the plan, but we must not salivate too much over the Razor Crest because we've got loads to talk about in this episode. We've got, and I'm quite excited about this, we've got not one, not two... Ooh. But three, Ooh. three listeners' Ooh. questions, Mark. Three listeners' questions. Three. We won't. Three. three. In a week where there's not a new Star Wars episode to talk about, let's dig into the listeners' questions people have kindly sent in. But first, some sad business. The writer of 1991's Dark Empire, Tom Veitch, has passed away. He also went on to do loads more Star Wars stuff. Dark Empire 2, of course, Empire's End, Tales of the Jedi, Greedo's Tale in the Mos Eisley Cantina. Passed away, aged 80. 
when you look back at that era, 1991 was a the real sort of the start of Star Wars coming back into the mainstream. Of course, you had Dark Empire, you had Heir to the Empire. It felt like a beginning, another starting point for Star Wars after a fairly fallow period. What would you have been at that point, about 11-year-old kid sort of being into Star Wars and, and starting to really get deeper and deeper into it as we all do and continue to do? What are your memories of that sort of Dark Empire period and that era of storytelling? That, for me, was really early Star Wars. As you said, I would have been 11, 12, and they were the first comics. In fact, they were the first comics I, I brought, I believe. And at the time, I wasn't a big comic collector. Those initial Dark Empire, Dark Empire 2, it's rife for rich storytelling when we consider what we got with a sequel trilogy and, you know, there was meant to be some point for at least for Rise of Skywalker whereby J.J. Abrams did revisit and look at Dark Empire, Dark Empire 2 and that for inspiration. And you can kind of see maybe where those nods are, especially Tears of Jedi and the Freedom Now Uprising. Those are, you know, some of my fondest Star Wars stories from that early Dark Horse era. And it's some of the best storytelling that I think we've actually had, you know, hands down. It's so difficult because we have so many comics and graphic novels and stories and that which kind of come out they stand out and i think they stand out for good reason it was a funny time period really bantha tracks had finished in about 87 88 you know moved to the lucasfilm magazine so so lucasfilm as a company took precedence over star wars as a primary focus of what was happening because they were moving beyond that and lucas was focusing on the ranch and by Lemma doing effects for not only other lucasfilm projects like indiana jones and willow but all sorts of other stuff trek and ghostbusters 2 all that sort of 89 period when they were really really busy and then you get to 91 and you've had air to the empire and now you get dark empire and i was a marvel and dc nut at that point so to go from collecting pretty much only marvel and dc and i was getting at one point i was getting like 20 20 titles a month it was everything i was into to suddenly switch and go to nostalgia in birmingham nostalgia and comics and start picking up dark empire and working my way through that was quite a change and I do remember I've got to say I, I remember going to the UK comic art convention and I think it was Mike Richardson from Dark Horse was there and it's before Dark Empire even came out and he had a folder talk about low rent it was literally just a regular off the shelf folder with photocopy pages from Dark Empire and you could just read through oh, it and, and I just remember yeah. standing there just reading through no script just pictures Cam Kennedy's drawings of Dark Empire obviously all of the you know the lettering and that had to be added to it but nevertheless there it was it was just a funny time period and here come Star Wars crawling back up on the on the inside rails again like oh wow Star Wars is still around and this was such a big part of that so terribly sad not a bad innings yeah. 80s a pretty good go but again it's another, another one of that era of writers and artists and creatives that's left us isn't it when I heard the news I was like he can't have been that old mm. and then you said like said 80 and you think you know that's like 30 odd years ago it's amazing how time is rapidly escaping all of us it's sad news and hopefully the Dark Empire comics and Tom's contribution to Star Wars won't be forgotten anytime soon hey this is Daniel Jose Older and you are listening to Fanta Tracks So last week we were talking on the show and we discussed the thought and hope and possibility that John Williams might once again write Star Wars music for a Star Wars project. Not entirely convinced that he would. It's been a long time since he's done any music for television, but he is coming back. He's writing the theme to Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's continuing his long association with Star Wars. He's coming up with a theme for a character like he did in Solo A Star Wars Story, finally giving Han a theme. Now he comes back and gives Kenobi a theme. Certain characters that never got themes before, now John Williams can give them the full treatment. First off, wasn't it nice that we were right about something for a change? It's very nice. Pat on the back and and more importantly, I'm well happy and stoked about that. Any chance that we can get John Williams to work on any new Star Wars is fine by me. On that topic, and I completely agree, I was really pleased that Williams was back because, good grief, was the guy's here and he's still making music? Make it for Star Wars. We did have a question come in. One of our many questions that's come in this week from James Burns. Not that James Burns, another James <laughs> Burns. This is Jamie R. Burns from the Free Radio Endor podcast. And his question is, do you think the new theme for Kenobi by the legend John Williams will be the last piece of Star Wars music he will write? Now, of course, he's 90, so he ain't getting any younger. Who is? But he's still productive. He's still doing stuff. He's still out there. You mentioned last week he did that concert in Berlin. and So he's still productive and doing stuff. But do you think there's other Star Wars projects? Given that Nicholas Brittell is now announced as the composer for Andor and there's no news of Williams doing any music for that, it feels like that's completely Nicholas Brittell that's doing that. Do you think there's any more John Williams music down the road? And if so, what do you think it will be? Personally, I think that John will do any work for Star Wars as long as he can. You know, I don't think he's likely to want to, to step away and put batten down. But I think 
as with Han Solo and obviously Obi-Wan Kenobi, maybe these are going to be themes or just a single suite for characters that we would have seen in the original trilogy. I don't think we're likely to get John doing something for, like you said, for Andor, because obviously he didn't write any of Rogue One's music. But potentially, if there's a, a character, maybe from the OT or even the prequel trilogy, perhaps, they decide to bring into a, a, a Disney streaming series, he might do it. I mean, mm. he has also gone on record to say he'd taken quite a nice uh, liking to, to Ray. So there's potential that, again, yes. if, if they did do something like a, a post-Episode 9 streaming series with Ray, there's potential there, or even if it's like, you know, not a direct five years on after Rise of Skywalker, but maybe set 100, 100 years or something, and there's a Skywalker theme needed, he might do it. That's my gut feeling. I, I would think that probably somebody like John Williams, who is the maestro and he breathes life and try not to say oxygen, but the oxygen of Star Wars with his music, I think he will always do it as long as he can. And let's hope that he can continue for many, many years to come. I think you make a great point, though, about Ray, because there has been rumours knocking around online this week that Lucasfilm were looking at doing something post. Rise of Skywalker, potentially a Jedi yeah. Academy type thing. And Williams was very clear that the reason he kept coming back was because he wanted to complete the scores for Ray. Mm. Seemed quite charmed not only by Daisy, but also by the character. So to me, the way it reads is that came back to do that hand theme in, in Solo because he never did a theme for Han. And he probably looks at all the characters. Wicket's got his own theme, for goodness yeah. sake. You know, there's loads of characters that are fairly low on the totem pole that have their characters' themes. And then characters like Han Solo that don't, you know, the first time you see Ben, you kind of get the vibe of the Force theme, which was yes. kind of co-opted into something else. So Kenobi needs his own theme. And it feels to me like he's looking at these things like almost like, it's not, but almost like unfinished business. Yeah, and it exactly. just feels like Tolkien adding the little notes in the side of the pages, like addendums and additions. And it's Williams has done the nine films, you know, and now he can yeah. go back and just add these little footnotes that in future, if you do something with Solo or you do something with Ben, that that theme, is there with Star Wars the main theme is the icon and you can definitely overuse the Imperial March but yes. outside of that you know you can go to these little themes and a bit of the Force theme a bit of Leia's theme of different characters have elements that you associate with them and I think it's wonderful that he's come back to do this so to answer Jamie's question I think he'll do more if there's the call for it and I think it's what you just said. I think if we ever go post Rise of Skywalker, I'd just have a sneaky suspicion he'd want to come back and do something associated with that. Maybe part of the reason he's come back is he had some idea for a Obi-Wan Kenobi theme originally. And, you know, there's people at Lucasfilm who would, may have known that. But also, like you said, there is that risk, isn't there, that with Obi-Wan Kenobi, you could overly use the Force theme too mm. much. So if you give Obi-Wan his own theme, which could be, you know, a little kind of piccolo, part but then expand upon it then it's a way of creating a different identity without having to keep on going back to the force theme or like you said the imperial march i mean they did it so well with rogue one when they went and they used darth vader's theme rather than the imperial march I and mean, they only used that like once or twice because again you only really see or hear the imperial march come empire because of yeah. the time period you kind of go okay well that kind of makes sense so i wonder if they're gonna maybe do something like that with it brilliant news that williams is back i think we're all stoked and can't wait to hear what he does whether or not we see anything pre-celebration when you kind of think that's when we're going to start seeing the bulk of stuff but i will go to another question we've had that go kind on. of fits in with all this neil lowry great friend of ours always bigging up fan the tracks on social media he's a lovely guy he did ask us a question Will Lucasfilm hold off on major announcements till Star Wars Celebration? And I just think that Williams coming back is a major announcement. That's out there now and we know it. Whether or not we hear anything before we see the first trailer or whether they use that music in the first trailer, because I think he's probably only recently recorded this music. It's Music's generally a fairly late in the process thing, isn't yeah, it? So, only the last, yeah. Do you think that makes sense? Do you think, like Neil says, do you think they'll hold off on any big announcements until Celebration? Because really, we're only about 100 days from Celebration and that's, you know, that's the Super Bowl of Star Wars. Wars, isn't it? You know, that's the place to yeah. make your announcements. So what do you think to that? Yeah, I tell you what, the new cycle with Star Wars and Lucasfilm is once upon a time, I think we could probably get a good idea and gut feeling of what they're going to do. But things just sometimes come out of left field, don't they? We just kind of get dropped without any hint or anything. So potentially, yes. I suppose it kind of comes down to what the focus of uh, celebration is going to be. There's going to be so many different panels. So there's, you know, every single panel will probably have some form of announcement, be it big or small. They're probably going to be holding off like the big ones, be it 
the announcement of whatever film is actually going to fill that December 23 spot. But then there might be other stuff which might just go out because, again, like I said, it's it's all clicks, it's all likes, it's all ratios and stuff like that in social media and we need to keep that content ticking over. It's a different world from, like, 10 years ago. If you don't put something out once every couple of weeks, people almost forget about you. I'd be interested to see, like, all the, you know, the analytics for Star Wars posts and stuff and actually see what the drop-off is for Star Wars engagement if they haven't had an announcement of some description for two or three weeks. When you're in between series and in between seasons, you know, and there's not a Star Wars show on telly that's got everybody talking, there's us. We're always going to have something to talk about, whether we're talking about what collectibles come in or just what's been going on at a troop or whatever. But generally outside of that, in the world, you know, I know certainly there's some days I'll go on to post stuff on Fanta and I'm really scrabbling around looking for news. Other days you're, you're swamped and you can't keep up with it. So I think that's a great point point that knowing that there's going to be so much announced at Celebration kind of think well there's probably going to be Horror Republic stuff and there's or we know there's going to be Kenobi stuff and there's likely going to be Andor stuff you know th- there's plenty that you think Celebration's going to bring us but to Neil's point you think they'd want to hold on to it until May but there's going to be so much news coming out in May that's going to just explode out of that convention plus Obi-Wan will have already started before celebration starts Obi yeah, launches good point. on the Wednesday and this celebration starts on the Thursday. So it's going to be all about Kenobi, you think? I don't know. I think they probably will try and hold off, but what constitutes major news? They want to announce a new game. That's a big deal. Announcing a game these days is as big as announcing a film in a way. Probably the thing that we haven't had is a film announcement. That's probably the big one thing that I think people really want. If Book of Boba Fett comes back and there's a Book of Boba Fett panel at Celebration, then that's where you announce Season 2 or Volume yeah. 2, shall we say. Yeah. What do you say about films there? You make a good point about films because films have kind of been kind of gone by the wayside lately yeah. because we're so focused on television. Do you think that Star Wars will try and get something into that time slot? It feels way too short now to me. I think yeah. they're probably going to be pushing everything back a couple of years. What do you think? I think so, yeah. I mean, with film releases being what they were for the last couple of years, I think we can, as fans and cinema goes, we're slightly more used to big tentpole films being delayed and pushed back. And I think maybe because of the Rose Squadron being dropped there is the argument that maybe they're going to put more eggs into the high republic basket you know and or even yeah. before the high republic to you know the quote-unquote old republic you'd hope that lucasfilm have learned some serious lessons from how they put out the sequel trilogy i think they might be taking a step back and going we we want to get it right we need to get it right from the get-go rather than try and retrofit something in at a later point right now as we record this, there could be a massive story breaking session at the ranch for the next Star Wars film. The fact that we don't know about it and we may not know about it until celebration or even later is fantastically exciting as far as I'm concerned. Hi, this is Julie Dolan, the voice of Princess Leia, and you're listening to Fanthatrax. It's your only hope. Great news. Film music reporter have reported, fittingly, that three-time <laughs> Academy Award nominated New York-born composer Nicholas Patel is the composer for Star Wars Andor on Disney+. Plus. We're getting it in 2022. It's a prequel to Rogue One. What do you think? Do you think that his score will adhere to what Giacchino did on Rogue One? Do you think, oh, which we've just found out recently, he's coming out as a physical four-disc set, which is fantastic news. We were talking about that on the show the other week. Wicked. And it's coming out not only in digital, but physical, so that's great. Do you think that will happen? Do you think it will be more like the Giacchino score? Do you think they're going to go down a different avenue and give us something sort of Boba Fett, Mandalorian, sort of slight left turn? What do you reckon? The Cruella score was pretty good. In fact, the whole Cruella film is pretty good, actually, if you get a chance to watch that. But that's so completely different to Star Wars. You can't use that as a yardstick. And I don't even think you could probably use Moonlight, really, as a a yardstick when that comes out. I think for a character that obviously is going to appear in a film in the timeline so you know we're seeing him first in Andor and then we see him in Rogue One you mm. kind of think they would want to try and kind of maintain some continuity of tone and theme with what we heard from Giacchino there I think the whole Mandalorian Book of Boba Fett Tatooine ethnic sound is probably something that we're probably only going to really see with Book of Boba Fett and Mandalorian maybe a bit of Kenobi because obviously it's set in Tatooine you know this could be yeah more of an intrigue it feels like it will stick a bit closer to the Rogue One score but also you obviously you mentioned Bond earlier and it feels Andor is a character Captain Andor and we don't know where he is in his rank at this point in his life gets to Captain Andor by Rogue One but never gets any further uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> but it feels like, you know, he's going in, he's doing assassination jobs, basically a hit, and different characters 
do different things. And Cassian feels like a utility guy in that he'll he'll spy, he'll assassinate, he'll deal underworld stuff. You see him do all of that in Rogue One. So he really is a, an impact player in that sense. He can do a bit of everything. But the spy angle feels to me like that could be quite an element which goes back to Bond. I think so. so. Mm. You know, so you kind of think, well, if they go for that traditional feel of a Star Wars score, which Rogue One was, Rich Solo was, and both worked brilliantly, that could work quite good. But again, Rogue One was an ensemble, wasn't it? Rogue One wasn't about Cassie, and it was just part of that kind of say, if you were going to pin your hat on any character in Rogue One being the focus, of course it's going to be Jin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Cassian, you know, he's a different character. He's from a different world. He's got different history. You know little bits about him being in the war since he was a kid and all the different things there. So maybe they'll want to take a different route and weave it that way. But it feels to me like Andor was a project. Okay, it's called Andor. But the the scope, and I could be wrong, but the scope of it feels bigger than it just being about Cassian, like Kenobi. He's the focal character, but the story from what we've seen, and we'll see more soon, just feels like it's bigger than just Ben's through line. It feels like we're going to see a lot more than just that. Very interested to see what Bretel does. For everything in one location, daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds, bookmark fanthatracks.com for Star Wars news 24-7, 365. If you have access to a computer and a pair of working fingertips, then you can vote for Rancho Obi-Wan in the USA Today's 10 Best Readers' Choice Pop Culture Museums for 2022. They nearly won it last year. They just lost out to, I believe, without researching, I think it was like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or somewhere useless and crap like that. It wasn't Rancho (laughs) Obi-Wan, so nobody cares who won. But this year, we want it to be Rancho Obi-Wan. Hopefully, it's going to keep crawling up that chart and get higher and higher until... When the numbers are counted and all is done, it comes in at number one. We've got a Rancho Goli this year on the 20th of August. We're going to speak to Steve and Anne before then to talk about what's coming on the show at the gala. We've got celebration before then, and Rancho's going to be at celebration as well. But, Mark, if you had the chance to vote for Rancho Obi-Wan in a poll such as this, is that where your tick would go? I've already voted, so yes, it would. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't know how you can come compare Rancho Obi-Wan to anything else. It's such a unique place. I mean, we've both been lucky to go and see smaller exhibitions like May the Toys Be With You. So to kind of like compare that to Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or, you know, any of the other places, it's really difficult. And I think it's a shining beacon that just stands apart from everything else. I totally agree. And I will just give you a quick rundown of the other competition. It's currently sitting in fifth. So number one is the Neon Museum in Las Vegas. Vegas, which is where all the decommissioned signs from all the hotels lives. It's basically a graveyard for neon. The birthplace <laughs> of Country Music Museum in Bristol, Virginia. In Memphis, the Stax Museum of American Soul Music. The Oz Museum in Kansas. Rancho's at number five. Needs to be number one, people. Grammy Museum in Mississippi. A Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is currently in seventh. The American Sign Museum. That's signs, not signing, but signs. In Cincinnati, that's number eight. B.B. King Museum in Indianola, Mississippi is number nine. And the American Jazz Museum in Missouri is number 10. So get voting. Get Rancho way higher than number five. It needs to be number one. Get voting. Vote Rancho number one. Some good company there. Some very interesting places. But nothing's more interesting than Rancho. So vote for Rancho, everyone. Go to the page on the site. Hit, hit, click, click. Do it every day. Make it number one. We can all celebrate another Star Wars victory. Come on. You can do it. (laughs) Fanta Drags. So, impressive news for the book of Boba Fett. Viewing numbers for the finale, Chapter 7 of Season 1, was an impressive 36% higher than the amount of people who watched the finale of Season 2 of The Mandalorian. Bearing in mind, that was the hottest show in the world, and everybody was talking about it back in December 2020. One and a half million households in the US watch that seventh and final chapter. I know a lot of people are talking about it online and he's kind of comparing apples to oranges because Mm. there's so many more subscribers to Disney Plus now, so you would say naturally the numbers are up. It's impressive numbers though, isn't it? Yeah, really impressive numbers. It's so difficult. And the thing is, you've got to think also, not just Disney Plus, you've got to aggregate that over like how many people are watching Netflix and Prime. Mm. And, you know, there's so much content. I get the viewing figures for the shows that I work on for Sky and you kind of go wow, some of those are in the millions and others kind of like less so. But then you kind of put it in perspective and you go, you know, some of this stuff goes by so quickly. 
it's a different world. Go back to like 20, 30 years ago when we only had four channels in, in the UK and you'd end up with like almost 30 million people watching one half hour episode of a soap. You know, it's a different world, Matt. But part of it is down to the fact that the effectiveness and the popularity of a Mandalorian has just been reinvigorated and made Star Wars more popular as well. And also for those who kind of like the cutesy wootsy kind of stuff, you know, with Baby Yoda and Grogu and there's more people who kind of like will just tune in to kind of see that kind of stuff as well so you know the fact is that i think it's also positive because if the book of boba fett final episode for season one didn't rate higher than the mandalorian that is more worrying than you know the fact that it, it has it just means that i think star wars is going in the right direction and more people are watching it that makes good sense and it brings us to another one of our questions that i'm going to ask you right now because it's kind okay. of relevant again Okay, so the question, hi dudes, I think he means us. I've been thinking about the Book of Boba Fett series since its finale, and although most episodes had cool scenes in them, I think overall the story was weak. We all love the pew-pews in Star Wars, but without a strong story (laughs) to back it up, it becomes meaningless. What do you two think about this? Cheers dudes, Skyhawker. So, didn't think the story was so strong, but there's something about Star Wars that keeps bringing us back. Do you think there's some validity to that? Because it did feel to me this season with Book of Boba Fett more than Mando in a way, and I think Mando hooked you in because there was a strong through line and a storyline to it. When you look back at Book of Boba Fett, it was kind of like you know somebody on roller skates dodging between traffic cones. It, it did sort of skirt left, skirt right. It didn't feel like in, in any ways a linear thing like the two seasons of Mando did. And you did keep coming back thinking, well, next week. You know, you listen to our reaction chats all the time. We're like, well, next week. What do you think to that question from Skyhawker? I think that's it's a fair point. I the best way I can describe it, and it, and it took me a long time to kind of like try and verbalize it. So the Boba Fett story, ignore the side trip to Mandalorian Town and all that stuff. But we actually look at the book of Boba Fett story. I kind of see what they're trying to do, but they just haven't executed it very well. They've got the Maison scene of like you know the Western and all the Western tropes, but there's just not the emotional pull that you need to get invested in the story and and invested in the characters. The storytelling just wasn't quite what maybe I was expecting or was hoping from this kind of story. And obviously, I I had no real expectations. I tend to not have massive or big expectations of things I Mm. want to see or anything like that before any Star Wars. And this is going right back to Phantom Menace. I tend to try and leave my expectations and my speculations to one side. So when I go in and I watch, I'm just presented with the Star Wars that, that is rather than trying to, you know, reconcile the Star Wars that we didn't get because they didn't listen to me in in a tweet or an Instagram yeah. post. So they just didn't quite nail it. And I don't know if it's because they were darting around a little bit too much. and they, Maybe they felt like they needed to cover all the bases quickly which meant that actually you didn't spend as much time with people so you didn't really kind of build up a relationship you know the dialogue was a little bit meh for the most part there's obviously you know you you kind of have Fennec who's pretty much acting as the guide for the uninitiated viewer which is why she's reminding Boba a lot of the times of what you know he needs to do you're gonna need to get some some hired muscle and it's like well Fennec and Boba are both hired muscle. That's what they do. That is pretty much their reputation. They're the people who get hired. So the fact that she had to explain it to him, it is purely just one of those things that you think, well, that is just because they've got to explain it to the viewer. And maybe the problem that now that we have, which is a good problem because we have so many new Star Wars fans coming in and people who don't necessarily live and breathe Star Wars in the same way as myself and you do and Mr. Skywalker, you know, you then have to explain some of this stuff in slightly more obvious detail and therefore it waters down the dialogue a little bit and makes it a little bit slow. So I liked the series overall, but, you know, it isn't without its faults, I think. I enjoyed it too tremendously and I think because like you say we're so steeped in it there's moments in Book of Boba Fett where you just got lost in the Star Warsness of it all ultimately that's not going to be enough for long term storytelling you can only go to the well so many times but it did feel like you said it was sort of dodging left and dodging right and trying to cover all the bases which it did it did touch on a little bit of everything it went back to Mandalorian storytelling it resolved stuff from Jedi it's 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 continuing stuff that we've kind of wanted to know for a long, long time. But also, by the same token, there were times when I thought Fennec felt more like Boba Fett than Boba Fett did. You know, uh-huh, there, there's, yeah. there's some, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So there were some little elements that I want to see a season two because I feel like there's this stuff to resolve, even though it kind of, if they never went back to the book of Boba Fett and seven episodes is what we get, you see Fennec and Fett in other Favloniverse shows, if you want to put it like that, then that's yeah. fine. And I don't think we will anyway, like we saw Ahsoka in this and Din Djarin in this and so on. 
But nevertheless, it did sort of bounce around a bit. But I think that's a great point he makes. You know, without a strong story, so many people reacted so well to seeing the Naboo fighter. Considering yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. prequel mm. trilogy vehicle that generally people have been kind of sniffy about for 20 years. And now, all of a sudden... That vehicle's back in the show and we're all going, oh, wow, look at that. What a hot rod, you know. And people were loving it. And it's that's that great benefit of the passage of time and the people who were kids. When that came out, like, I was a kid when Star Wars came out. Yeah. If I'd not seen an X-Wing for 20 years and an X-Wing turned up, I'd be, like, reacting in the same way. I happen to have always liked the Naboo fighter, so I, I was stoked to see it anyway. But you can only do that so many times. You can only drool over seeing the Falcon in Solo so many times. You can only go, wow, look at the Razor Crest so many times before it's like, oh, it's another ship. There are all these elements that they can only pull the rabbit out of the hat so many times before you want to make a stew out of it. You need that strong story. And I think maybe season one of Book of Boba Fett felt like it was laying the groundwork for lots of other stuff. And I think we said this on Reaction Chat as just part of that broader story, even in a way that includes things like War of the Bounty Hunters. You know, there were certain things happening in The Mandalorian that just made me think of what we just read in that comic series. But that's only going to work for folks like us who read the comics or certain books and such. So I think you said about how Fennec had to keep explaining things to Fett. Your logical head goes, Fett knows all this. Yeah, you know, don't teach the dude to suck eggs. He knows all this, but as a viewer, that maybe not everybody's as, as into it as we are. You kind of tacitly know stuff because you just kind of know it. You've been around it for so long. Exactly. You need that Basil exposition moment, don't you, to sort of explain everything to the to the viewer. I kind of almost wonder if bizarrely the series might not have been long enough. I mean, if you look at shows like Deadwood and even like something like Westworld and that, they're slower builds, and I. have I think they were trying to do something that kind of almost needed a slower build, but with slightly more articulate and precise dialogue and storytelling. You know, there could have been a story between Boba and Gaza Thwip, maybe a bit of a love interest or something. And it just felt like they've tried to tick all the boxes for this Western trope. Either they didn't know how to really execute it in a way that would work, or that they were trying to just keep it too concise and it kind of maybe have just felt like it needed to be a bit longer for example as much as i love seeing cgi luke with cgi baby yoda jumping around rocks and stuff if that had been boba learning to train rancor scene that would have made a lot more sense to me and then yeah it would have been um a a bit stronger when we kind of then see and maybe have again like some kind of like boba rancor relationship the one thing that we don't really see in any of the book of boba fett we're told about how bad the pikes are you know how bad it is for for mos eisley and mos esper and tatooine in general but we don't see the pikes coming into town they come off like a pno ferry type star cruiser and then that's it until we get to the battle at the end. So I kind of almost felt like, again, we needed to see why is this so bad for Tatooine? Bar the fact, obviously, everybody's anti-drugs. But why is this bad? What you know? How is this going to work against the average person? Why are they going to be downtrodden and stuff like that? And also, why Boba felt like he had to protect him? Like, who gave him the right? Nobody asked him. You know, it's not like he saw anything. It wasn't like a conversation with uh, Tuscans. I, they, they kind of said, you need to protect Tatooine as a whole. He's just taken upon himself, which is very altruistic and great. But I kind of feel like, again, we didn't really get that moment to see why he's decided to take it on. You know, he keeps on saying, people are counting on me. But we're not seeing the people. and We're not kind of seeing the, the women and the men and the, the kids who are kind of going, we're starving and we haven't had any water and, you know, that kind of stuff. Help us, Boba. It's just, just like walking through town and kind of going, oh, yeah, these people are counting on me. And everybody Everybody's kind of going around doing their business. At the end of the day, I saw Boba Fett riding a freaking Rancor laying waste to like half of Mos Espa. So I'm happy with that. And yes, I really hope that whatever kind of story threads that they laid in this season gets picked up in the Book of Boba Fett, Season 2, Volume 2, whatever you want to call it, or in the, the wider Star Wars storytelling going forward. If this had been 20 years ago, this story had been happening 20 years ago, that you would look at a show like Book of Boba Fett and go, Lucasfilm were very savvy because they're not tying all the bows in a nice tidy knot. They're leaving things vague because they know that we can put a book story in there, we could put a comic series exactly. in there. Exactly. Maybe season two, we could come back and tell them why and how Boba Fett rode the rancor. But I think now, because we're moving so swiftly through storytelling, we've got Kenobi coming in not that many days now, less than 100 days, and then beyond that, you're thinking Bad Batch, and then beyond that, you're thinking Andor, then season three, Mando. By then, we'll know there's a film coming and such. So you don't have anywhere near the time 
for books and comics and different, you know, ancillary stuff that you always had before. So on one hand, I'm thinking they're being quite canny here. They're leaving loads of plot holes because I got into a conversation about, about Kenobi online with somebody who said, there's no way that Ben and Vader can meet because Vader said this in A New Hope. And my reaction to that, my answer to that was, well, that's Vader talking about the last time Vader met Ben. That's not Vader talking about the last time Anakin met Ben, because you've got to remember that Vader, that name has no meaning to him. When Vader's talking about what I did, he's talking about what the armoured Darth Vader did. He's not talking yeah. about what little Annie did on Tatooine when he was 10. That doesn't matter. That's a life that's gone. So, you know, you can massage the meaning of certain things that are said to make it fit. If Lucasfilm can do that with a 45-year-old film, they can certainly do it with a series that only came out a few weeks ago. So on one hand, you're thinking they're leaving loads of potential storytelling moments to fit in if they want to. But in the real world of 2022, you kind of know they're never going to go back and fill in a lot of what they've left open in season exactly. one of the Book of Boba Fett. So it's old school Lucasfilm storytelling, but it's 2022 and they're not going to get the chance to go back and fully exploit. And I mean exploit in the best sense, like really fill out and expand to go back and do that. Whereas there's a hungry bunch of us who want to go back and see, well, I do want to see how we rode that rancor, you know, I would like to see that. Or like you say, the Gars of Whip thing, it's like, I always felt that there was more to her character. Felt like she was going to be more substantial, what's more her central real? to the story, yeah. Totally, and there's more to her as a character. It's not like I want to go back and have those plot holes filled, because to be honest, it's not a big deal. I just feel like those are things that probably should have been in the story to begin with. Yeah. Again, you know, if we're short on time, so to speak, it's like a couple of lines of dialogue, like, right, I'm going down to see the Rancor and try and train. You know, something random. You're always with a, a legacy character like this, and this this is the same with, you know, some of people's reactions to Luke as well in this series as well. You're always fighting against people's notions of where the character is and what the character should be doing. You're always fighting with ideas and stuff like that that they've either had because it's headcanon and speculation or it's because they, you know, we've read something about what Luke was doing 20 years ago in a, in a comic and that is because we've never seen that part of Luke's life, for example, challenged. That's how we've always maintained. So that's our continuity. You know, it's that reconciliation is part of the problem. And it's not Lucasfilm's problem. They don't need to reconcile. It's, it's down to us. It's down to the fans. We're the people who have to reconcile Legends with new canon and, and our head canon with what John Favreau and Dave Filoni and Robert Rodriguez wanted to do. And, you know, let's be fair, they delivered a show at the end of the day and a show that beat The Mandalorian with its viewing figures. So you can't complain too much about it. Mark, I don't know about you, but after three questions, I'm pretty much done for this week. So I think it's about time we wrap this episode up and head out of here. If you'd like to be like any of our lovely listeners who have sent in questions this week, then, Mr. Newbold, can you tell people how they can get in touch? Yes, I can, Mark, and this is how you do it. If you want to be a part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, visit fanthatracks.com or check out the free... Ooh, free, yeah! Find the Tracks app through the App Store to follow us on your mobile device. You can reach out to us and send in all listeners' questions by emailing radio at fantatracks.com. Like our three questions today, we've got some questions for next week, but keep sending them in. Comment, like and share on any of our social media feeds at Fantatrax, and be sure to subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five-star one, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Fantatrax intro, Adam O'Brien for our making tracks opening music, and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for for our voiceovers and for the 128th time that is me done for this episode on that note everybody stay safe take care thank you very much for listening i hope to catch you at episode 129 which will drop this time next week until then may the force be with you coming up next on fanta tracks radio it's another episode of making tracks Doo-doo-doo-doo-doo-doo.